So, can you all hear me better? Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here. I uh, spoke at this conference, I believe, the year before the pandemic, so it's nice to see everybody again. Uh, I'm Sakith Guntapali. I'm chief of G1 Oncology at the University of Colorado. Uh, I have a focused interest in sexual dysfunction uh, in women uh, with gynecologic cancer, but this talk will be pretty broad uh, across the whole cancer spectrum. Um, I don't have any financial disclosures uh, for this talk. Um, you know, malignancies of the gynecologic tract, we all know, uh, they include cervix, uterus, ovary, uh, fallopian tube, vagina, and vulva. And as a group, gynecologic malignancies represent the third most common uh, cancers that affect women in the United States. There are about 83,000 cases of gynecologic malignancy in the United States every year. And very sadly, that number is growing due to uh, the increased incidence of uh, endometrial cancer, uh, which is one of the few cancers which is increasing. And if you really look at the distribution, we see cancer across uh, the breadth and spectrum of a woman's life. Um, and as we have improved the survival for many cancers, particularly gynecologic cancers, one of the things that we've tried to focus on more is on survivorship. Um, and one of the least addressed issues in the realm of survivorship is that of sexual dysfunction. There are several reasons for that. Many people are embarrassed to bring this topic up, both on the provider side and on the patient side. Ignorance about the issue. People don't know how to treat sexual dysfunction in cancer patients. A lack of prioritization and a lack of resources. All of us are in clinic. We're trying to get through clinic. We're trying to get patients in through chemo, through radiation. And uh, sadly enough, this is one of the last things that people talk about is sexual function. But this is a very germane topic. This is something that is coming up a lot. There were two articles in 2017, right before uh, the book that I wrote had come out, which really, really talked about this topic and said that we need to be addressing sexual dysfunction in uh, patients with, with cancer uh, globally. This is a story that they wrote about one of my patients in women's health, uh, about a woman that underwent a pelvic exoneration and actually had to have her entire vagina removed, and how she built her sexual life uh, after such a devastating surgery and diagnosis. So what is sexual dysfunction? Well, sexual dysfunction broadly is defined as any problem during uh, the phases of the sexual response cycle that prevents an individual or a couple from having a satisfying sexual experience. So that's a very broad term, but it is a very all-encompassing term for what sexual dysfunction is. And there are really two groups of causes of sexual dysfunction. The first are organic causes. So these are things that are related to a disease process or something that's functional. So diabetes, heart disease, and hypertension are probably the largest organic causes of sexual dysfunction in patients in general. Things like liver disease, cancer, alcoholism, drug abuse, those are all organic causes of sexual dysfunction. Inorganic causes are things that are a little bit more difficult to treat. So the things are stress, anxiety, concern about sexual performance, depression, uh, and uh, past sexual trauma, which is an incredibly, incredibly important thing to screen for uh, in our patients, particularly in, in women. Um, and how does sexual dysfunction affect cancer patients? Well, it's a pretty broad range. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Don Dizon, who is uh, in Boston, reported that the crude prevalence of sexual uh, dysfunction in women with cancer is about 70%. And what was the reason for this? Well, they found in this study that there was significant embarrassment both on the part of the provider and on the patient to bring up issues of sexual function, as I said before. Uh, there was an impression that nothing could be done about this, that this is just something that patients, particularly women, just had to deal with. And only about 14 to 15% of physicians actually brought this topic up with their patients. So we know now, and we have really good data, that this is a very prevalent issue and something that is very common amongst cancer patients. Uh, and specifically in cervical cancer, this was a study that was done out of Taiwan. Uh, they kind of mimicked what Dr. Dizon found in his study in Boston, crude prevalence of 66% in a cervical cancer cohort. So again, this is a very big problem that affects uh, people with cancer, uh, and particularly women. What about how does the sexual dysfunction associated with cancer affect marital relationships? And this is something that had never really been explored um, you know, in great detail until uh, the study that we ran a few years ago. What are the effects of that sexual dysfunction on intimate partner relationships? Um, and that is something that is very important because obviously a diagnosis of cancer is going to be something that is going to affect uh, an intimate partner relationship. 
They've done a little bit of data on this. This was a very, very uh, well-coded study uh, looking at uh, patients with brain tumors, both men and women. Um, and what they found uh, in this cohort is that the rate of divorce or separation uh, was uh, similar to the baseline fun uh, population and if you looked at all patients, but when you broke it up by gender, women were at significantly higher risk of partner abandonment if they had brain tumors, 21% versus 2%. That was inversely correlated to um, a length of the relationship. That's huge. That means that your biggest risk factor for your partner abandoning you if you have cancer is that you're a woman. I mean, that's, that's huge. I mean, that's something for us that we all have to keep in mind. And what happened to these women after partner abandonment? This was, I thought, really interesting. More likely to be hospitalized, less likely to participate in clinical trial, less likely to complete cranial radiation for their brain tumor, less likely to die at home. We all know that one of the biggest um, metrics that the NCI uh, and the National Cancer Institute are looking at is are patients dying at home or are they dying in the hospital? and less likely to receive multiple regimens of chemotherapy. So these issues have implications even for overall survival. Um, in gynecologic cancer, we wanted to look at this in, um, in our pot patient population, uh, where we our hypothesis was it would be a significant decline in women's sexual functioning and an impairment in intimate relationships after a diagnosis of gynecologic cancer. Received a very large grant from the Patty Brisbane Foundation. Uh, published this in a, a large study um, uh, that was presented in uh, Lisbon, Portugal. Uh, the specific aims of this study were to show that there is a decline uh, in women's sexual functioning after diagnosis of gynecologic cancer and to explore how that affected their intimate partner relationships. Uh, we conducted a 181 item questionnaire, uh, both pre and post treatment. We looked at the female sexual functioning index. So this is really important for everyone in the room. If you're trying to look at sexual function change over the course of a treatment, this is a validated measure in cancer patients as well, as well as the intimate bond measure, which is a, a survey that a patient can take to assess the, um, the strength or quality of their intimate relationship. Um, Again, this is just some specifics on that. We recruited 321 uh, uh, patients into this study. We found a crude prevalence of sexual dysfunction of about 40%. Um, when we looked at which cancer type that were included in this study, it was you know, kind of well distributed about the type of cancers that we see in G1 oncology. Uh, these were the treatments that patients received. So you'd see most patients received surgery as some form of their treatment in this study that we conducted. And then onto the meat and potatoes of what we found, uh, we basically found that there was a very significant decline in sexual functioning after treatment for gynecologic cancer. Now this can be kind of um, taken further because what were the interventions that we used? We used surgery, chemo, and radiation. Well, that can generally be applied to all cancer types. So we can, I think, safely say that this does affect that. Uh, how did sexual activity change in terms of frequency? Uh, about a 57% decline in the number of sexual encounters that women had pre-treatment and post-treatment. Um, globally, sex was uh, less pleasurable and all types of sexual activity decreased. So what were the risk factors in this study? Well, being uh, under 50 years of age was a very significant risk factor for impairment of sexual function. Receiving chemotherapy, and my understanding, this was the first study that we had conducted uh, that was conducted that actually showed that chemotherapy use was an independent risk factor for sexual dysfunction. I think we know that, but we showed this in a, in a powered study. Um, in this cohort, having ovarian and cervical cancer, uh, and as well as being in a significant relationship. Uh, after treatment, how did women report the quality of their sexual functioning, as well as um, what were some of the things that they, um, that they reported? Well, about 15% ended up in relationship counseling, which I thought was very, very provocative. Um, and obviously, the, as I said before, the number of times uh, that they were having uh, sexual activity decreased substantially. So what about the, intimate, the intimacy portion of this? Um, changes in marital function uh, were not significantly associated with sexual, significant uh, sexual dysfunction, but I do want to review some of the descriptive data that came out of this. Um, 3% of women reported that their partner had an extramarital affair, 9% reported separating from their partner for a period of time, and 5% reported divorcing after their cancer diagnosis. I thought this was really interesting. In essence, one in 10 patients in this study actually separated from their partner after a diagnosis of their cancer. And I think that that's very, very uh, important for us to keep in mind 
What it tells us is we need to be talking to our patients about this. We need to be asking this uh, of our patients. These are things that often happen in the infusion suite. These are the things that often happen during radiation because there is a little bit of downtime during those things where people can have more of an interaction. So I think it's really, really important to integrate this into your processes about asking about things. How are things going at home? How are things going with your kids? How are things going with your spouse? I think is very, very important. And then some other qualitative things that came out of this study is that women reported that sex was less enjoyable uh, after a diagnosis of cancer and treatment, significant frustration with their sex life, particularly if they were younger, feeling depressed about their sex life, feeling like less of a woman. And um, I think that this is really important uh, to note. Um, in the book that I wrote, one of the things that surprised me the most um, is that women really, really describe hair loss as the single greatest, um, uh, single greatest thing that bothered them as part of their cancer diagnosis. It wasn't the scar from the surgery. It wasn't the loss of ovaries. It wasn't side effects from radiation. The number one thing that they said that they felt a loss from was losing their hair. Um, and that made them feel like less of a woman. And that actually was so prevalent in all the surveys that we did. We did a little bit of a deeper dive. So we talked to a few patients about that. And they basically related that for women, and this is, I, I think this is uh, specific to women, um, they said that losing their hair felt like they had a scarlet, le oh, sorry, scarlet letter on their chest. That the minute they stepped out, um, one of the patients in the study told us that um, she was in Denver Airport going along those long um, moving walkways, and uh, she said that everybody that was on the moving walkway that was walking towards her knew she had cancer because she didn't have hair, and just that she was sickly, that she was less of a woman, um, and that is very striking, and it's something that we really need to think about. How are the treatments that we're giving affecting our patients uh, psychosocially? Uh, a significant loss in confidence in, in, in their sex life and worrying about the future of their sex life. These were all things that were very, very significant in the study that we did. So what were some of the conclusions? Doesn't take a rocket scientist to, to see what the conclusions were from this study. Women treated for gynecologic cancer and really cancer in general are at significant risk for impaired sexual functioning irrespective of diagnosis. Younger women, those that were treated with chemotherapy, um, those that had ovarian and cervical cancer, and women in relationships are particularly high risk for sexual dysfunction decline. And patients with sexual dysfunction reported greater incidence of sexual activity decline and relationship counseling uh, following their treatment. So I wanna spend a few minutes talking about approach to sexual dysfunction in cancer patients in general. So we talked a lot about, a little heavy on GYN, but most of this can be abstracted and attributed to uh, really all cancer diagnoses, regardless of gender really. Um, the way I approach this and the way I think that it's really important to approach this is communication between the partners. Oftentimes what you'll see in a patient with a cancer, whether male, female, is that Partners are not communicating with one another, and that sounds like very trite and overused, but it is really the most important part of a, a sexual function intervention if you're trying to talk to a couple about how they're going to rebuild their sex life after a diagnosis of cancer. Uh, a great example, I think, is I had a patient who got treated for ovarian cancer. She subsequently finished. She was no evidence of disease. She was doing well, and I asked her at the end, I said, have you started having intercourse? And she said, no. And I looked at her husband and I kind of said, well, why? And they both sat there very quiet. And he said, well, I didn't want to bring it up because I didn't want to seem like a jerk. And she said, I wish he brought it up. I've wanted to have sex for the last three months. <laughs> and so, you know, that lack of communication really, like, you know, I think highlights how important that it is because she wanted to engage in sexual activity. He didn't want to seem like that was all that was all on his mind. And so the two of them, I think, you know, were able to get through that very easily. Um, use of a very high-end lubricant, single biggest intervention to improve sexual activity in patients with cancer, particularly in, in women, patients that have undergone radiation that are getting um, these sort of very large debulking surgeries. The vagina becomes very dry, particularly after the ovaries are removed and oftentimes induced from chemotherapy. Use a very, very good lubricant. Um, I'm not supposed to give brand names. I would just say that, you know, not the ones that we all think of and certainly not the ones that we're using in clinics um, are not gonna be good lubricants to use uh, for sexual intercourse. Um, 
so I think that that's very important. Um, one of the things I try to tell patients is to go buy a lubricant together. It can be a sexually arousing activity for patients, and I think that it's very important for them to potentially do that together. Okay. The other thing that I think is really important is to view sex through a different lens. This is how all of us are taught from the time we're teenagers to look at sex. It's foreplay, intercourse, orgasm, and then you're done. That's how everyone in this room is conditioned to think about sex, okay? And you have to think about sex differently, particularly after a diagnosis of cancer, because things are different. And I think having that discussion before starting therapy is gonna be very important. And having that discussion after therapy is gonna be even more important because things are different. Um, after you get six rounds of carbotaxol or you're getting maintenance Pembro, you know, maybe sex isn't the first thing on your mind. And it's gonna be something that's gonna be a little bit more of a challenge and something that you're gonna to have to think about a little bit more. How does sex change after surgery? How does sex change after you have a big scar on your abdomen? People have to try different positions, and people also have to think about what is sexual in a little bit of a different light. Um, in the book that I wrote, one of my patients, the one that had her vagina removed because of her cancer, she in essence said, how is she, was 50 years old when that happened, how is she gonna spend the next 20, 30 years of her marriage with her husband? And she said one of the most sexually arousing things from her was riding through the mountains of Colorado on his Harley Davidson with her just kind of clutched, you know, on his back, you know, holding him while they drove through the mountains. And she said that for her, that was an incredibly sexually arousing experience. And so you have to think about sex differently after a diagnosis of cancer and particularly using these things like better lubricants and thinking about sex differently, I think is gonna, be, is gonna be very important. And you have to think outside these parameters. It's not just about sex. For most patients, men and women, men are conditioned to think of sex one way, women are conditioned to think of sex another way, but for people, if you really ask them what is sex about, it is about the intimacy of being with another person and, and concentrating that, particularly after diagnosis of cancer, I think is what patients really, really verbalize as to what they want. Um, practitioners need to be aware of these issues, be proactively engaged. 90% of patients are not gonna bring this up even though they're thinking about it, and it is an important part of improved survivorship outcomes. I'll talk a little bit about medical interventions. Flibanserin was a drug that was approved by the FDA in 2015 for hypoactive uh, sexual dysfunction disorder. So these are for women that do not have the desire uh, to have sex. And this um, was studied as a antidepressant. This was a side effect that they saw. Bremetolamide is another drug that works in a similar pathway that is taken about 30 minutes before sex. Uh, but again, I would consult with your gynecology colleagues uh, before initiating this therapy, but there are some medical interventions that you can use. Testosterone is, this, is the driver, is, um, is what drives sexual drive in women, just it does as in men. However, particularly with ER positive and hormone positive cancers, you have to be a little bit uh, careful about using those interventions. But again, talk to your GYN colleagues uh, about that. Um, finally, this was a book that we wrote. Um, I wrote this with one of my patients um, back in 2017. It's a nice, um, resource, I think, for patients and for providers on how to approach sexual function in women um, and men uh, after a diagnosis of cancer. We did get a review in the New York Times about it. They were reasonably kind, so that was, uh, was good. After putting all that work in, they didn't tear apart the book that I wrote. Um, so yeah, that's it. So thank you. I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions, happy to answer them. I think there's one, two questions right here. Um, thank you so much, that was so informative. So for patients outside of the GYN spectrum, you know, I think about like our, colonos our, um, our colorectal patients that have a lot of concern about their colectomies and their bags and things like that. I would love to know what your recommendations are for patients um, where they have kind of like an ongoing issue like that and that sure. definitely I felt like interfere with right. intimacy. Uh, so we, you know, we have patients that have colostomies, urostomies, and you know, obviously that is not a very sexually provocative thing to have. Um, there are actually appliances that you can use now um, that can be purchased um, online where you can actually kind of cover it, uh, that area in a way the bag comes off, you clean it. Um, and you can actually cover it so it's not vis visible or not apparent during intercourse. Um, that, I think, is probably 
almost a requirement uh, in some ways, but that's what I would encourage um, them to explore, and those can be fun. I think they're called um, endoclostomy belts or urostomy belts that you can put over that cover it during intercourse or intimate activity. So I think that would be something that I would look at. Mm. Uh, thank you, I, I wanna just really thank you for addressing this subject. It is not the GYN oncologist, you know, and the rad radonks, well, I do radiation, they just barely address this. And uh, as nurses, we really have a responsibility to our patients to spend a lot of time with them and address these subjects that you brought up. Um, a lot of our patients use vaginal dilators and uh, it takes a lot of time, you know, some people just hand it to them and lubricant and they give them, you know, the lubricant we use in the hospital totally inadequate. There's so many good lubricants and um, sometimes you might want to talk to male-male partners what they use because those are very, very moisturizing and uh, suave, I think, was the word you used. I like that. It took a while to figure out an appropriate word to use in a, in a, in a, in a professional setting, but suave is a good word. Yeah. One other thing we do, um, there is a uh, physical therapy place that we send some of our patients to but they're like the only one around and they do exercise and talk about um, uh, post-cancer treatment and vaginal disorders. And, but they're so overwhelmed, they've stopped re accepting our patients. So that's another resource to use when it's available. But Definitely. really thank you for addressing this. Thank you. Hi, I have a question for you. I'm in the back, way back here. I can't see. Other side. Okay. Hi. I think I see you. The light is blinding. Uh -huh. um, you know, I found that women um, with cancer who have cancers that are either GYN or breast cancer, their clinicians are really good about having those conversations with them in general. However, when it comes to the malignant HAME population, which typically is a younger population, right. and really struggling with other issues um, like thrombocytopenia, where um, even with a good loop, sexual intercourse can be um, hazardous to their health, I found that um, practitioners and nurses are not willing to have those conversations or even let them know that, hey, when your platelets are 10, you really shouldn't be having intercourse. How would you recommend um, to this group who's seeing those patients, how do you have those conversations? How do we kind of help um, push our um, prescribers to also have those conversations and, and how can we help those patients still have a fulfilling sexual life even when it needs to look different? You know, I've given this talk, I think, a hundred times. I don't think I've ever had anybody ask me that question, um, which is very uh, important. Um, I hadn't really thought about that. Like, you know, um, I will tell you that, you know, the first thing that you have to do is obviously, like I said, you know, having a diagnosis of cancer and then having intercourse is going to be different. One thing that we generally tell patients is within 24 hours of chemo not to have intercourse because we, we do have some data that shows that um, chemotherapy is secreted through the mucous membranes in the vagina and the mouth. Um, so we don't want to expose a partner to that. Um, so first thing is, you know, having that discussion about when, it, when is it safe. Um, I think you know, the, the providers, you know, certainly in heme, they, they need to have that discussion because it can potentially be unsafe if you're having intercourse with platelets of five or 10 and the such. I mean, and coming in with a vaginal bleed, um, you know, after intercourse because your platelets are 10 is certainly not going to help uh, that situation. So what I would say is, you know, in GYN and in breast, we're a little bit more attuned to it because we're dealing with the sexual organs. So, I mean, we, we are a little more attuned to it, but you just have to, the, the, the providers and the practitioners just have to keep it on the radar. I definitely think, I mean, they've looked at this, 90% of these discussions are actually had with, with the nursing staff, either an infusion, like they're not bringing it up with the, with the, the providers are giving chemo, like that are signing the chemo orders, they're bringing it up in infusion. So I would just encourage everybody here to maybe have that discussion as well. I think they also feel more comfortable having it uh, in that setting. So I would just say it's gotta be at the forefront of what you're doing. I have a question from the virtual audience mm. that asks, are there any ingredients or bases of a lubricant that we can suggest a patient look for when they are purchasing a lubricant, understanding you can't provide specific brand names? Well, I would say that in general, uh, you can buy them online. Um, just type in high-end lubricant um, and they'll you know, deliver it discreetly to your house. Um, a lot of patients will go to an adult store with their partner. They'll look for one that's, you know, some people like CBD-based lubricants because it gives them a little bit of a, uh, a high with that. Um, so some patients like that. 
Um, so that's what I would, I would suggest in terms of looking at that. You can look at them online. They're very, I mean, 700 will pop up if you type it into Google. So you can have your choice. Thank you. Thank you.